Hello, and welcome to Ipsy Dixit, a podcast and legal scholarship. I'm your host, Luce Nguyen, a student at Oberlin College and co-founder of the Oberlin Policy Research Institute, an undergraduate public policy organization based at Oberlin College. My guest today is Joanna Schwartz, Vice Dean for Faculty Development and Professor of Law at the University of California, Los Angeles School of Law. We will discuss her article, The Case Against Qualified Immunity, published in the Notre Dame Law Review. Welcome, Professor Schwartz. Thanks for having me. So let's go over the basics. Uh, Why did you write this article and what are your main uh, points that you try to make in this article? So this article is part of an issue that Notre Dame Law Review dedicated to the issue of qualified immunity. And the reason that Notre Dame uh, dedicated an an issue to this question, I think, is because qualified immunity doctrine uh, plays an outsized role in constitutional litigation uh, and in the ways in which people think about the, the barriers to relief in civil rights cases. So the most basic answer to your question is I wrote the article because Notre Dame was putting together this compilation. But the interests that motivated Notre Dame are also interests that have been motivating me. I've been spending um, the past several years doing empirical research that examines the realities of constitutional litigation um, and the ways in which those realities contradict or undermine assumptions the Supreme Court's made in its the qualified immunity jurisprudence. So I thought that taking some of that research and putting it together in what was, I thought, a case against qualified immunity um, would would gather that research together and would also hopefully create some uh, blueprint for advocacy moving forward against qualified immunity doctrine. So as a quick refresher for the listeners of the podcast, can you go over what qualified immunity doctrine is and its basis in the courts and in the law? Absolutely. So qualified immunity is a doctrine that in its present form shields government uh, defendants, executive, um, members of the executive, which include law enforcement, um, from liability in damages cases if they've not violated what the court calls clearly established law. Uh, By the court's current uh, description of the doctrine, clearly established law um, is usually um, law from the Supreme Court or the circuit, the federal circuit where the case is being heard, or from a consensus of cases from other circuits and district courts around the country, holding that factually similar conduct is unconstitutional. And so what the Supreme Court has said is uh, plaintiffs who are suing law enforcement, for example, in order to overcome qualified immunity, has to find factually similar cases from their circuit, the Supreme Court, or a consensus of cases with factually similar precedent holding this conduct is unconstitutional. Um, Qualified immunity doctrine was first announced by the Supreme Court about 50 years ago in 1967. And it was described at that time as a doctrine that was um, essentially parallel to a state law good faith defense um, that Mississippi, which was where the the case had been brought, that Mississippi uh, state tort had for false arrest claims. So in that case, which is called Pearson versus Ray, the Supreme Court said that under um, Section 1983, which is the statute that allows um, for constitutional claims to be brought against government defendants, there was a qualified immunity that was um, the same as the good faith defense under Mississippi law. Um, And so in that case, granted qualified immunity for the officers in this false arrest case um, based on that on that qualified immunity. But the shape of qualified immunity and the underlying justifications for the doctrine have shifted dramatically over the past third, uh, excuse me, 50 years. 
1982, which is 15 years after the the defense was first created and described as this good faith defense, the Supreme Court, in a case called Harlow versus Fitzgerald, expanded the justifications for qualified immunity and described the doctrine as necessary to shield government officials from the costs and the burdens of litigation, from the threat of financial liability, from the dangers of over deterrence on the job, um, and changed the test for the doctrine um, to provide that that an officer's subjective evil intent or bad intent was irrelevant to qualified immunity. And really all that mattered was whether the law was clearly established. And then over the the subsequent years, the court has um, repeatedly, and especially in the in the past 10 years or so, repeatedly denied uh, relief to plaintiffs in civil rights cases, holding that the plaintiff uh, has been unable to point to factually similar cases uh, that uh, would have put the defendants on notice that their conduct was unconstitutional. So you say factually similar cases here. Would you mind expanding on what factually similar means within uh, litigation and within the courts? This is a terrific question. Uh, and, um, you know, I wish that the Supreme Court would give us a little more guidance in this area. Um, and the court really hasn't been very clear about what it means to be factually similar, but I can give you a, a little bit of a, of a taste for um, for what the what the state of the law is and what remains in question. So the court has held um, in a case called Hope versus Peltzer uh, that a constitutional violation can be obvious without uh, precisely um, factually on point precedent. Um, that was a case in which a prisoner uh, was attached to a hitching post for several hours without water or, or breaks. And the Supreme Court said, we don't need a prior case hold with factually similar conduct to make it clear that that conduct is unconstitutional. But in more recent cases, the court has repeatedly talked about the importance of finding um, precedent that is more um, factually particularized is a word that the court has used to the facts of the case. The court has repeatedly said they don't need a case precisely on point, but the facts must be similar enough that it would be clear to any officer that their conduct violated um, or was inconsistent with that prior case. So the court has, has spilled a lot of ink talking about um, the need for factually similar cases, but it's not given clear guidance about how factually similar those cases need to be and under what circumstances uh, there needs to be factually similar precedent. And I think part of the problem is that it's that it is a um, very difficult standard that they've created to um, to draw bright lines about. Um, every case has different facts. And so understanding how similar those facts must be um, is something that courts are struggling to do and litigants are struggling to do. And I think that there are different answers that are percolating to those questions among the circuits and even within the Supreme Court itself. Are there any particular circuits that you would point to that are advocating a type of factual similarity that you would support? Well, I think that it's even hard to generalize about the different circuits um, because, of course, each each circuit court decision is is a subset of the circuit court judges, and even among the judges themselves, uh, there can be a variety of opinions. Uh, if I had a magic wand and was able to um, adjust qualified immunity. It still existed, but I could I could uh, tinker with that standard. I would probably do something along the lines of um, what Professor John Jeffers from UVA has suggested, which is to think not about whether um, cases are uh, factually similar, but whether the conduct is clearly unconstitutional and take a step away from um, the pressure to find 
factually similar cases on point. And I would do that for a couple of different reasons. One, I think requiring plaintiff's counsel to find factually similar cases is quite burdensome. It's it's expensive, it's complicated, it's time consuming. And second and relatedly, I don't think that the push for prior factually similar cases is really getting at the heart of what the Supreme Court had in mind when it created qualified immunity, which was to discourage the the filing or permit uh, quick resolution of cases that were borderline. But there can be a lot of conduct that is unconstitutional and clearly unconstitutional without um, having a prior case uh, having shown that. And I guess the third and related reason I think that this would be a better approach is that it the, the notion that police officers and other government officials are scouring prior circuit and district court cases uh, and going through some uh, collection of those cases in their mind before acting doesn't reflect the state of police training. It doesn't reflect available evidence that we have about decision-making in uh, circumstances that are high pressure, high stress, and time constrained. And so the very idea that an officer's liability should turn on whether there was a prior case on point um, seems seems almost irrelevant to the question that I think the court was intending to get at when they created the defense. So a huge part of this is one of your arguments that qualified immunity does not achieve its intended policy goals. And some of your previous research and uh, research after this article has uh, delved into that. Would you like to go talk about why qualified immunity doesn't achieve intended policy goals set by the Supreme Court? Sure. So um, as I as I had mentioned, and just to, to step back and, and set up the relevance of this slightly, when, when the Supreme Court created qualified immunity, they described it as um, connected to common law, state law, common law defenses um, in parallel state court claims. The Supreme Court has then subsequently talked about uh, qualified immunity doctrine as based in um, common law principles that existed at the time Section 1983 became law in 1871. So at the time that uh, plaintiffs became able to sue government officials for constitutional violations, the court has said there was some something like qualified immunity. Uh, there's been a bunch of research um, showing that um, that argument by the court um, of, a, of a common law um, basis for qualified immunity is inconsistent with the information that we have about um, litigation practices and indemnification and the state of the law at the time. But as early as um, 1982 in the case Harlow versus Fitzgerald that I'd mentioned a few moments ago, the court has said that qualified immunity is actually intended to achieve policy goals and has acknowledged that Qualified immunity doctrine doesn't look anything like the state of the law in 1871, uh, and that the court is all right with that because they believe that qualified immunity achieves these other benefits. And so the court has said that among those benefits are the, the need to protect government officials from the threat of financial liability, meaning paying settlements and judgments in these cases, and from the distractions and burdens of being a defendant, um, going through discovery and trial in these cases. And so I've read those opinions and decided that I wanted to test their empirical basis. So the first big study I did relevant to this question um, is a piece called Police Indemnification that was published in 2014 in NYU um, Law Review. And what I did in that case, in that article, excuse me, was um, submit public records requests to about 150 law enforcement agencies across the country seeking information about the total amount that had been paid in settlements and judgments and claims against law enforcement over the six year period and the number of times in which an individual officer contributed to a settlement or judgment uh, 
in one of those cases. Uh, I got back information from 44 of the largest departments across the country and 37 smaller departments. And what I found was that individual officers um, contributed about 0.02% of the dollars that were awarded to plaintiffs in um, these cases out of hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars awarded to plaintiffs. Um, a tiny, tiny fraction was paid by individual defendants. And that money was paid by individual defendants in three of the jurisdictions. So in all of the remaining jurisdictions, there were no payments made by law enforcement officers during that study period. And I found in subsequent research that even in the very, very rare instances in which an uh, individual officer is left on the hook, so to speak, for those damages awards, that plaintiff's attorneys very rarely collect on those awards for a whole variety of reasons. So taken together, this evidence strongly suggests that there is very little threat of financial liability from settlements and judgments in cases involving law enforcement. And I and other people who have looked at this issue haven't done the studies for other kinds of government officials, but there's every reason to believe that those same practices exist. Um, so a key justification for qualified immunity doctrine, um, for shielding from financial liability, really turns out not to be borne out by the evidence. There's a second uh, claim, as I had mentioned, that the Supreme Court has made that the doctrine shields government officials from costs and burdens of litigation. So then in a subsequent study, I tried to uh, explore the empirical uh, support for that argument. And what I did for that study, um, which is uh, in a law, in a law review article called How Qualified Immunity Fails, which is published in Yale Law Journal in 2017. I looked at federal filings in civil rights cases involving law enforcement officers and agencies uh, filed over a two-year period in five federal districts across the country. And I looked at the frequency with which qualified immunity was raised and the uh, frequency with which motions were granted, the frequency with which those grants actually ended the case the stage of litigation at which the motions were brought and resolved, um, and how the cases uh, ultimately ended. And what I found was very, very few cases were dismissed on qualified immunity grounds before discovery. 0.6% of the cases that were in my almost 1,200 case data set. And about 2.6% of the cases were dismissed at summary judgment on qualified immunity grounds. Um, meanwhile, qualified immunity was raised in about a third of the cases and sometimes raised multiple times during the course of litigation. So what I conclude is that qualified immunity doesn't do a very good job of dismissing cases before discovery and trial. And it may, in fact, increase the costs and the burdens of civil rights litigation because the parties who are litigating these cases have to go through the time and the complexity of briefing qualified immunity, finding factually similar precedent. Uh, and they're also threatened with the possibility of interlocutory appeals, which are immediate appeals of qualified immunity denials. The Supreme Court has said that defendants have the right to bring those immediate appeals um, when they turn on questions of law. And so interlocutory appeals add, can add, on average, more than a year um, to the time that it takes to litigate these cases. So in that article, I argue that far from reducing the costs and burdens of litigation on defendants um, and parties and the system, it may in fact increase those burdens and challenges. And these are arguments that I've made um, in the case against qualified immunity as reasons to conclude that the court's um, intended policy goals, objectives for the doctrine really aren't bearing fruit. And the court has said that in, a pro, in an appropriate, uh, or that they might uh, revisit uh, qualified immunity doctrine if there was evidence showing that it wasn't achieving its intended goals. And I think that this is strong evidence that the doctrine isn't achieving its intended goals and that the doctrine should be reconsidered.
So one of your arguments is that uh, qualified immunity renders the Constitution hollow by uh, restricting the uh, cases in which, and restricting the um, ability of courts to rule on certain constitutional questions. Would you like to expand on that? Sure. So Justice Sotomayor has written in a couple of cases recently that she's concerned that qualified immunity renders the protections of the Fourth Amendment hollow. And she's uh, meant that, I think, for a couple of different reasons. Um, I certainly believe it for a couple of different reasons. Um, one is that because qualified immunity doctrine uh, has, holds that an officer's subjective intent is irrelevant, it means that an officer who is acting in bad faith can be shielded from liability, even if uh, the the officer believed that he was doing something that was beyond the scope of the law. Um, and he would be shielded simply because there was not another case on point. So one way I think it renders the protections of the constitutional constitution hollow is that it, it uh, shields officers who, who have malicious intent or improper intent from liability. I think the doctrine also renders the constitution hollow because it creates real uncertainty about the scope of constitutional rights. Uh, there's a line of cases, or excuse me, there's, there's, a, there's a case um, from the early 2000s uh, called Saucier versus Katz that held that when a court is deciding a qualified immunity motion, they should first answer whether the Constitution was violated and then answer whether the law was clearly established. And the court said that this was important to do because that answering that first question, deciding the constitutional question, would provide guidance to courts and government defendants moving forward about the scope of the law. In 2009, in a case called Pearson versus Callahan, the Supreme Court said that courts deciding qualified immunity did not need to answer the first question. They could simply hold that the law was not clearly established without ever ruling um, on whether there was a violation of the Constitution. And what that case uh, allows is for courts to rule on the con excuse me rule on the on the qualified immunity question without ever resolving the constitution question and leaving up in the air and unresolved um, issues of constitutional importance so others have argued and i agree that qualified immunity doctrine in its current form leads to constitutional stagnation or stagnation of the development of constitutional rights i also think for what it's worth it creates a double message. The Supreme Court has a double message about qualified immunity. To plaintiffs who are bringing these civil rights claims, the court says, you have to find factually similar cases in which a court has held con the conduct unconstitutional before we allow your case to go forward. Then to courts, the Supreme Court says, don't worry, you don't have to resolve the constitutional question. And that creates a vicious cycle in which it becomes more difficult for the plaintiff um, in these cases to get past qualified immunity. So uh, the doctrine shields bad actors, uh, creates constitutional uncertainty and stagnation. Uh, although, as I have said, I don't think that the doctrine is ultimately the reason that um, that many cases are dismissed. The cases in which they are um, is, uh, serve injustice to the plaintiffs. And I think that the Supreme Court's decisions, which have been uh, rendered with some frequency in recent years, in which law enforcement officers use deadly force um, and are excused from liability, send a chilling message to law enforcement that, as Su Supreme Court uh, Justice Sotomayor has said, officers can shoot first and think later. So moving on, what should lower courts be doing to address these issues? In your paper, you suggest uh, doing what uh, Richard Wee has suggested of uh, narrowing from below and additionally exercising their discretion to manage qualified 
uh, immunity le litigation? Can you expand on what you believe the role of the lower courts is to reform qualified immunity doctrine? Sure. So, of course, lower courts cannot reverse the uh, Supreme Court. Um, although, for what it's worth, uh, a number of lower courts, district courts and courts of appeals in recent years have been expressing significant concern with qualified immunity doctrine. Um, but even within the bounds of qualified immunity, I think that there are a number of things that district courts and circuit courts can do. So you mentioned Richard Ray. Um, he has talked about uh, this idea of narrowing from below that, that when uh, lower courts uh, are faced with some ambiguity and uncertainty in Supreme Court jurisprudence that they can they can view that uh, that precedent narrowly um, and craft a decision and analysis that comports with Supreme Court doctrine, but perhaps a narrowing of or a, a, a narrow view um, of that doctrine. And I think that that's certainly something that the lower courts can do in the case of qualified immunity. As I'd mentioned, in Hope versus Peltzer, the United States Supreme Court said that a prior case on point is not necessary when you have an obvious constitutional violation. And lower courts can, and some do, um, use that power and the precedent in Hope versus Peltzer to find that uh, there is an obvious constitutional violation for which a precisely similar factual um, precedent is unnecessary. I think that courts um, can also uh, think about um, the, the factually similar, how factually similar precedent needs to be on, on, on a bit of, a, of, a, of an adjustable scale. So there's certainly the argument that a constitutional claim is obvious for which factual precedent is unnecessary. There also can be different levels of analysis there, a conclusion that prior factual cases, um, while not precisely on point, are sufficient enough to put officers on notice of the unconstitutionality of their conduct. I think that courts can uh, work with, um, or excuse me, I think that courts, when looking at qualified immunity motions, can view these motions as um, ones for which they are able and perhaps even obligated to do their own independent research in situations where they don't feel that the plaintiff has uh, brought forward the right cases or enough cases um, to support their point. Qualified immunity is a legal question. The question is whether there's a prior uh, legal case on point. And in other aspects of the law, district court judges and courts of appeals do their own independent analysis to assess uh, whether there's applicable law for a um, to reach a particular legal conclusion, I think that they are certainly able to do that when they think about um, qualified immunity motions. And I think finally, when courts are considering qualified immunity, I think that they should keep in mind whether the policy goals of the doctrine are being met in the particular case. So, one goal, as I mentioned, is to shield officers from financial liability. If the case is being heard in a jurisdiction where 99 times out of 100 or 100 times out of 100, officers are being indemnified, not being required to contribute to settlements and judgments uh, in cases brought against them, this is, a, this is a fact that the court should keep in mind. If the court has a case where they're considering a uh, Rule 50B motion, which is a motion after trial, to find that the um, plaintiff's claim fails as a matter of law, the court should keep in mind that the burdens of discovery and trial, which are, according to the Supreme Court, the driving purpose uh, behind qualified immunity is to shield against those burdens. The court should keep in mind that those burdens have already been um, uh, experienced. Discovery has already happened. Trial has already happened. And so there's an open question about what goal qualified immunity, granting qualified immunity in a case like that would achieve. I think the courts could think of a similar point when they are um, considering cases that have federal claims as well as state law claims. So state law claims uh, do not have the protections of qualified immunity. 
when a court is deciding whether to grant a qualified immunity motion, they could give thought to whether granting qualified immunity in this case is actually going to shield a government uh, defendant from costs and burdens of litigation if the state law claim is going to be able to proceed to discovery or trial. And as a successor question, what should the Supreme Court be doing? Well, I, I'm of the view that the Supreme Court needs to take a long, careful look at qualified immunity doctrine. A number of Supreme Court justices have said that qualified immunity um, raises concerns for them as well. Uh, Justice Sotomayor, as I'd mentioned, uh, says that qualified immunity renders the protections of the Constitution hollow, and Justice Ginsburg has signed on to a few of those cases where Sotomayor expresses concern about the doctrine. Uh, Justice Breyer has said in another context that if government defendants are indemnified, some of the purposes of qualified immunity um, are, are no longer being met. Former Justice Kennedy uh, uh, made uh, similar points that uh, the availability of summary judgment through revitalized summary judgment standards uh, diminished the need for qualified immunity doctrine. And most recently, and probably the the uh, discussion that's gotten the most attention, Justice um, Clarence Thomas in 2017 uh, raised concerns that qualified immunity looks nothing like common law protections that existed in 1871 when Section 1983 became law and urged his colleagues that in an appropriate case, they should reconsider qualified immunity. Uh, it's unclear if they take up that invitation to reconsider qualified immunity, exactly what they will do. And it's an interesting question in part because you might be able to cobble together a majority of justices critical of the doctrine who are critical of the doctrine for very different reasons, some relying in uh, common law and um, sort of originalist uh, notions, others about concerns about police accountability. So it will be interesting to see whether the court takes up this um, suggestion. But um, to my mind, uh, there are a number of things that the court could do that would improve on the current state of affairs. One would simply be to do what I had mentioned uh, previously, which is to adopt something along the lines of what John Jeffers has suggested and focus not on whether there was a prior case on point, but whether the conduct was clearly unconstitutional. And I think that would achieve the court's intended goals for the doctrine um, without focusing so unnecessarily, I think, and unnaturally on the existence and factual similarity of prior precedent. I also think that available evidence suggests that interlocutory appeals should be done away with because they're not achieving their intended policy goals. Um, but truly, my own view would be that we should eliminate qualified immunity altogether or return it to the good faith defense that existed in Pearson um, versus Ray in 1957. Um, and my own view is that there are many other protections against the filing of insubstantial cases, many other challenges and burdens that plaintiffs need to get past in order to succeed um, in court in these cases. Um, ranging from pleading standards to summary judgment standards to the substantive constitutional requirements of these claims uh, to juries who tend to be unsympathetic to these cases. There are many, many protections built in that will shield government officials from financial liability and will shield government officials from costs and burdens of litigation. Uh, and qualified immunity, to my mind, is is adding an extra level of protection that's actually not doing what it's intended to do. Uh, and getting rid of it um, would focus these cases on what I think should be the critical question, which is whether government officials are exceeding the scope of their authority under the Constitution, and not whether a prior case with factually similar uh, circumstances has said so. As a final question, uh, you and other scholars of the law of qualified immunity submitted an amici brief before the Supreme Court in Doe versus Woodward, together with uh, William Bodd of UChicago, uh, Karen Blum at, so at Suffolk, uh, 
Alan Chen at the University of Denver, Barry Friedman at NYU, uh, Priest at Richmond, and Fred O. Smith Jr. at Emory University School of Law, uh, talking about the about qualified immunity doctrine. Would you mind tell, telling the podcast what your hopes and goals that for this uh, brief and what you hope the Supreme Court will do in the future regarding uh, this case? Sure. So I should say this is uh, a group of scholars who have uh, submitted a, a prior amicus brief as well to the Supreme Court in another case last July called uh, Allah versus Milling. And in that brief and in this brief that was just filed um, uh, April 10th, uh, the, the group of scholars that you have mentioned um, set out a lot of the arguments that are in the case against qualified immunity, um, arguments that qualified immunity doctrine looks nothing like the common law that was in existence in 1871, that qualified immunity doctrine doesn't achieve its intended policy goals. And that brief is really um, trying to make the case against qualified immunity, as I do in my article, directly to the court um, so that they have this evidence available to them um, in, the, in the possibility that they do reconsider qualified immunity. And I should say, um, we are not the only uh, group that submitted an amicus brief um, in this case. Most exciting to me, more exciting than the brief that we filed, in fact, um, is uh, the fact that there are advocacy groups across the ideological spectrum, ranging from the ACLU to the NAACP to the Second Amendment Foundation to the Cato Institute, um, to the Institute, of Just Institute for Justice that have filed an amicus brief with the Supreme Court as well in Doe versus Woodard, arguing that qualified immunity doctrine undermines interests in government accountability, um, that the doctrine is uh, illegal or unsupported by the law in its current formulation, and that the court should not be concerned uh, about stare decisis when it recon considers the, the doctrine. So it's not just a bunch of scholars that have gotten together to uh, try to get the court to change their position on qualified immunity. It's advocacy groups across the ideological spectrum, groups that um, don't tend to agree about things and may not agree about anything else, who have joined together to ask the court to reconsider the doctrine. And I've described the ways in which I think the doctrine should be improved. The briefs, uh, don't don't finally answer the way in which the court should shift the doctrine, um, in part because I think there's a lot of points of view, um, and I have a number of different points of view about ways in which I think the doctrine should be improved. I think that the court needs to take account of what this doctrine is doing and the ways in which it has failed to achieve its policy goals um, and based on that evidence and a and an honest uh, assessment of that evidence uh, think about what should come next well that's all the time we have thank you professor schwartz for coming on the podcast it's my pleasure thanks for having me She's gone.